Hello and welcome to this Morgan Stanley special. We have with us the brains trust of Morgan Stanley, Jonathan Garner, their Asia equity strategist, and a little later, Chetan Ahia, their chief Asia economist. The MS team is very bullish on Asian emerging markets for the year 2023 on the back of an expectation that Fed's rate hikes will end and the Chinese economy will start opening up. First, let me welcome Jonathan Garner to tell us why they see Asia at an inflection point. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for joining us and also for what is a generally benign view on uh, emerging markets and Asian emerging markets. Well, first up, why are you so positive? Uh, is it all hinging only on uh, the expectation that uh, US uh, rate hikes will end in the first quarter and probably rate cuts in the last quarter of 23? Yes, that's an important part of our view, but it's probably less important than the idea that the US dollar has just made a major peak. In fact, over the last two weeks, the US dollar has had one of its uh, biggest declines in recent history, down about 8% trade weighted. And that tends to help on a translation effect uh, the earnings streams from emerging markets. We're also emphasizing a lot that a new upcycle in semiconductors and technology hardware is uh, poised to begin. And that's why we upgraded Korea and Taiwan within Asia and EM at the start of October. And I'm pleased to say both those markets are already performing very strongly in the last few weeks, which is highly indicative that the overall EM asset class uh, has reached a trough. Uh, okay, yeah, Jonathan, I was coming to that. Your overweights include Korea, Taiwan, Saudi Arabia and Brazil. Equal weight for China. India is not in either list. It's actually an underweight. So before I come to those reasons, do you expect that funds could flow out of India into China? Do you expect funds to flow out of India at all? So actually, if you look at foreign investor flows, they've been uh, negative in relation to India for some time. And India is by far the most expensive market in our coverage. Um, in fact, at a record high valuation premium, for example, to, to Korea. So, uh, we, yes, we do have an underweight recommendation on India. It's not that we expect the market to actually fall. Uh, we're broadly constructed, but it's not going to have the kind of explosive returns off the trough that we're already getting for Korea and Taiwan. Uh, well, uh, uh, just to scratch the point for the, uh, uh, further about Asian recovery, uh, I'm not opposing the view, but I'm just throwing some uh, devil's advocate kind of arguments. You know, at the moment, at least India is seeing a lot of pain on the export front. We just got the October trade figures. And for the first time in many decades, or probably many years at least, our export growth has contracted. It is less than last year. It is less than last month. It is the lowest in 20 months, actually. Now, we are hardly an export-dependent economy. Should it not be hurting the other Asian EMs more? Well, it, it already has done. So if you look at Korea and Taiwan uh, exports year on year on what's going on in the pricing of uh, semiconductors, in particular memory, uh, we're in the middle of a major bust. Uh, but that's when uh, stock price troughs form. And the market is starting now to look out uh, a full year from now to what the environment will be like in the back end of 2023 and early 2024. So there's no doubt that we've been in a very difficult environment, particularly since the summer in the whole traded goods sector globally. Um, it's, a, it's a recessionary environment, and that's why these markets performed so poorly, massively underperforming the Indian market until about uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, when they trough, they tend to trough in a very pronounced V-shape off the bottom, and that's exactly what we're seeing for some of the leading stocks um, which we've upgraded, like uh, Samsung Electronics, TSMC, LG Display, and others. So your thesis is that uh 22 is a bad year, but we are at an inflection point and 23 is going to be a very good year for Asian EMs, right? Well, we, we can be quite specific. We think the trough was last month in October okay. and uh, this is a, a rally that is developing steam right now. If we're right, then the peak to trough decline in the EM index is 42% in dollars. So that's worse than average for an EM bear market and it lasted over 600 days. Oh, yes. So I know for an Indian audience, it doesn't feel like a bear market because you haven't really been in one. But for the broad EM space, this was one of the worst bear markets ever seen. Yeah, exactly. That's the table in page three. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, that kind of a fall is not something we saw in India. Uh, but uh, Jonathan, uh, 
you know, in India itself, earnings growth for FY22, that is the year that ended on March 31st, was as high as 39% Nifty EPS. This year, it's barely going to be 10% Nifty EPS. Would you say that India's Nifty EPS growth could be better next year? So again, there's a, there's a rhythm here because that earnings growth that India's been able to enjoy is not what you've seen for China, Korea or Taiwan, the markets that we're getting more constructive on. And so, yes, uh, you know, as long as interest rates and the oil price are relatively well behaved, Indian earnings growth can you know, not grow as rapidly as they have done historically, but still grow. But you're paying up a lot for that. Um, you're, you're of the order of 50, in some cases, 70% valuation premium to the, the North Asian markets that are now troughing. Um, there are other markets that have a similar characteristic. Indonesia and Singapore have also outperformed during the bear market. And there are other markets that we're turning less constructive on as we're freeing up space to buy these classic early cycle cyclicals. Uh, well, this is more a Chetan Nahia question, but nevertheless, I'm going to put it to you because as an equity strategist, you have to take a view. Currencies, uh, most of the Asian EMs have been under pressure. Do you expect that to continue for a bit more uh, before they actually bottom out? I mean, uh, there was a worry that the rupee, which had gone up to 83, could go even up to 84 or 85. Does that fear still remain? So our fixed income and FX strategists also think that there's been a major trough in emerging market currencies across the board associated with the major peak in the US dollar, which peaked at a 40-year high. And as long as US inflation continues to roll over and terminal Fed's funds pricing remains where it is and then goes lower next year, then this will turn out to have been one of the best opportunities, uh, certainly that I've seen in the 30 years I've done this job for buying both emerging markets uh, currencies, uh, local government bonds, uh, dollar sovereign credit and equities. It really is a, a, a very significant opportunity for people to upweight in Asia and emerging markets, broadly speaking. Okay. Uh, let me quote from your own report, and you may perhaps know this like the back of your hand, the important statement on India, we are tactically underweight Indian equities on relative valuations and technicals and expected to lag any rebound from an EM trough, but we look for entry points into a compelling structural outlook. So when would you uh, time that entry? Yes. Well, it depends how much underperformance we get versus the markets we've upgraded. And there's quite a lot of, of that al already, so we're watching carefully. But the, but the latter part of that quote that you kindly read out was referring to my colleague Ridham Desai's India Blue Paper about the medium to long run opportunities in India, which are very uh, considerable, particularly in attracting uh, inward FDI and the very positive long run demographic uh, effect on the market of having such a young population. So hence the mutual fund boom and, and, and all, of, all, all of those positive features. So that's what we we're trying to say is that because this is to some extent a target rich environment and we can upgrade Korea and Taiwan with high conviction here, we are underweight India tactically, but we're not ignoring the strategic uh, bull case long term. Uh, even as you say that, you say that you say that you are still very positive on Indian financials. So you continue to buy that sector. Yes, so we do have some recommended exposure there. And again, that links a little bit back to the point I just made about currency, but also, again, just in terms of household formation, underlying earnings growth dynamics for a young population, Indian financials are clearly differently positioned than, for example, Korea or Taiwan or China financials. We're not focused on financials in those markets where you don't have such uh, positive tailwinds. Uh, you mentioned somewhere in your notes that your uh, uh, Asia technology team is extremely bullish. Oh, so would that include being bullish on Indian tech stocks as well? They've not been the best performers this year, obviously. But you think that they ha uh, that would inc come into your buy list? Well, what we really talked about um, in Asia X Japan is, is the leading semiconductor and technology hardware names, some of which I mentioned earlier, and they're just simply not present in the Indian market. What you have is uh, IT service contracting out outsourcing names. Um, which certainly we're, we're broadly constructive on, but you, you don't have the giant semiconductor names that you can buy in Korea and Taiwan. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let me uh, look at the other point that everyone uh, who is an India watcher is uh, referring to, the domestic Indian equity support. Uh, even in the months from June, July, August, or even before when uh, there was a large drove of FPI money moving out of India, there was extraordinary support from domestic savings and investors. 
do you see that continuing yes. and would that give the FBI a feeling that they are missing the opportunity of getting into India? Is that likely to keep India well bid? Well, yes, that domestic bid for India is something we've talked about um, in a number of reports uh, from Ridham and the team o over the years. And it's why the market has held up well and is now extremely expensive versus other markets. I I'm not seeing any great uh, interest in buying back India yet from our foreign institutional clients. It's really directed more to the markets that I've mentioned, you know, throughout our interview. Um, and certainly one does have to be careful because kind of retail investor booms globally. Um, have ended badly in almost every other geography, obviously, notably in the United States around the growth and meme stock investing. I'm not suggesting that that's uh, as extreme a situation in India, but certainly um, the valuations are very rich to history and to peers, and that's why it is an, an underweight for us. Okay. Uh, well, uh, something related to, uh, uh, you know, equities, but uh, it's more a commodities question. Uh, how confident are you of a recovery in China? After all, uh, if China really starts consuming, then we should see a boom uh, or a bullish uh, tenor to commodities as well. Are you expecting that in 2023, commodities to get expensive? Well, we are getting incrementally more bullish about a China reopening trade, having been very skeptical up until recently. But yes, we've seen some important changes since the party congress on COVID management approach. And certainly it'll be gradual, we think, particularly around mobility and use of oil. So, you know, air, air travel and, and, uh, and driving your car. But it will build up as time goes on. And so we do think the oil price is relatively well underpinned here and it's unlikely to go much lower. Uh, what are the dangers or uh, the likely things that may falsify your thesis? What can go wrong? The red flags. Well, the obvious ones are if we're wrong about the peak in inflation in the U.S. and in rates and in the U.S. dollar. Those are the obvious macro uh, elements. And then it's all about how does the tech and semi-cycle heal from here. You mentioned earlier on in the interview the decline in, in traded goods activity, so the weakness in exports. So we would want that to be improving from, let's say, the summer of next year onwards, uh, that it wouldn't turn into a multi-year multi uh, bust. But, um, but for the time being, uh, things are, are going pretty well uh, for this call. We're four weeks or so into it now, and um, so far so good for the strong performance from Korea and Taiwan. Okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan, especially for that optimistic note. We need to go into a break, and thereafter, we're going to have with us Chetana here, the chief Asia economist of Morgan Stanley.